So thank you, Sabine. <coughs> I would like to talk about how to negotiate uh, venture deals. Uh, if you don't know me, my, na my name is Matthias. I'm a former hostage negotiator. I worked for law enforcement for more than 17 years. And after that time, I started my own company. I'm a founder and entrepreneur. Uh, our office is based in, um, in Zurich, New York, and um, Hong Kong. We operate globally, and so here's what we do. Um, do you like this guy? <laughs> is he a good negotiator? Yes. Who thinks he's a good negotiator? Okay, I agree. <laughs> uh, we don't have to like him. From a negotiation perspective, he's doing a great job. We can talk about him later on. Um, there are a lot of tough negotiations are going on right now. As you know, North Korea, uh, East Ukraine, um, the Brexit is coming up, the, the deadlock situation. Uh, what we do, we step in. If uh, leaders, if they call us, if they have no idea what to do, if they're in a so-called deadlock situation, uh, they exchanged all ideas, all options, and then they, they don't know what to do. Uh, this is the second where we step in with our company, with our consulting company, and then we support our clients in deadlock situations. What I would like to show you is uh, how to handle deadlock situations, how to handle difficult negotiations, because if you understand the importance of a deadlock, then it's easier to negotiate. Uh, as Sabine mentioned it before, if you do have questions, you can start typing in your questions right now, and I would like to give you an overview about the most important principles, and then I would like to uh, answer all your questions. So if you do have a question, just type it in, and then we will focus on this. I'm a former hostage negotiator, um, so I'm trained to negotiate with these guys. Um, I started my career as a regular police officer in Munich. Uh, then I joined the Drug Enforcement Agency. I worked six years undercover. After that time, I uh, went to university. I studied law and psychology, and then went back to the Ministry of Interior and became a member of this task force. What I would like to show you is an example. I would like to start with an example of a hostage taking. It's a real case. And I would like to ask you what, what, would, what you would do in such a case. There was a man walking down the street in the center of Munich. He has a gun. He was hiding this gun in his uh, inside pocket, in his jacket. He went directly to a young woman. He took her at gunpoint and told her, well, you have to come with me, otherwise I will kill you. He escorted this young lady to an apartment. He closed the door, he closed the curtains, and a lot of people, of course, they observed this situation. They called the police, they informed us, and then I would like to show you what's going on if the police starts a, a special force plan. Um, police officers are arriving, police cars, uh, they block the streets, and uh, as you can see, the helicopters are circling, SWAT team is arriving, so they block the streets. You might be wondering, um, they came a long way from Chicago to Munich. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to use uh, the official videos, that's why I'm, I took a sequence of this movie, it's The Negotiator, it's a, a great uh, movie by the way. And I would like to ask you, what do you think, what's going on in the mind of this guy, of the hostage taker? He is in this room, he has a gun, he has a hostage. And he knows there is no way out. The streets are blocked, as you can see. Uh, he knows there is no way out. The helicopters are circling, the snipers are taking their positions, the SWAT team is, is uh, preparing to storm uh, this apartment. The streets are blocked, and now it's time to call the hostage taker. If the, situa if the situation is secured, that means no one can get in and no one can get out. If the situ situation is secured, the negotiation team they pick up the phone, they call the hostage taker, and in this case, um, my colleague called the hostage taker, and the hostage taker told him, I want a getaway car, black Mercedes, and one million euro, otherwise I will kill the hostage. So here's the question, what would you do? As a police negotiator, what would you do, what would you say? Give me some ideas. Sorry? Start talking. Okay, talk to me. I'm the hostage taker. <laughs> what would you say? We need time to get the money. 
We need time to get the money, so you would tell him that money is possible? You would ask why? Okay, here's a very important principle in the negotiation. Sorry about that. Uh, never ask why. <laughs> um, this sequence is also for your private negotiations, by the way. <laughs> um, never ask why, because why is always about the past, and it's always about who is guilty. Yeah? Why haven't you finished your homework? <laughs> Why didn't you buy the milk? <laughs> it's always about the past. It's always about being guilty. So never ask why. So he, came up with, um, he comes up with one million euro and a black Mercedes getaway car. What about telling him no? What about saying no? <laughs> you won't get it. Is it smart? It makes him angry. What about yes, we can talk about this. What about negotiating the car? Like uh, a white Toyota would be better for you. <laughs> <laughs> no? What about offering a compromise? 500,000 instead of 1 million? <laughs> no? So here's, now it's getting interesting. What about the rational approach? What about telling him, um, calm down? <laughs> Think about it. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Let's keep the emotions out of our discussion. <laughs> Is it helpful? No. Uh, next question. What about, so later on we will talk about some, le so some legal aspects. What about telling him, dear hostage taker, from a legal perspective, <laughs> uh, I have to tell you, you're not allowed to take a hostage. <laughs> uh, what about telling him that he's wrong, that he's not allowed to do it? Is it good? He knows it already. He knows it? Watch out. Does he know that he's wrong? No. Or does he believe he has the right to take a hostage? Yes. Yes, he believes he has the right to take a hostage. So, and I would like to ask you, do you sometimes believe that you are right? <laughs> yeah? Have you ever told your partner that they are wrong? Yeah. Have you ever told your partner at home, for example, uh, darling, you are wrong? Yeah, you did? In your first marriage. <laughs> what was his or her uh, reply, answer? <laughs> Thank you, now I can see the light, right? <laughs> no. It's a very important, it's a very important principle for negotiations. A negotiation is, is, is never about right or wrong. Uh, so you should never use the word right or wrong, because if you tell them that you are right, they have to say you're wrong, and that's not a negotiation anymore. That means you, are, you should never come up with an argument in a negotiation. Um, a negotiation is different. A negotiation is to find a solution. So the goal is always uh, to find a solution. Yeah? Andreas? How about asking him if he is needing a driver additionally? So what about uh, asking him if he needs a driver? <laughs> um, well. Uh, uh, in general, a good idea. <laughs> um, there are no um, getaway cars. So if you're from Germany, you, you po possibly remember um, Gladbeck, 28 years ago. Uh, it was the last case where they handed over a, a getaway car and it ended in a disaster, as we all know. So there are no getaway cars anymore. The question is, yeah? What's his plan after the hostage taking? After getting the car, then he would imagine that he will get a car. <laughs> uh, um, so before we get, uh, before we talk about uh, the tactics and, and uh, um, the, the techniques, I would like to ask you one more question. What's our goal? So what's, what do you think? What's the goal? To freeze a hostage. Freeze a hostage. Yeah. Okay, number one, freeze a hostage. Do we have a second one? Okay, no violence for neighbors, third parties, okay? One more? Catch him, arrest the hostage taker. One more? Don't let the president for the future, very, very important one. What about the police officers? <laughs> okay, no overtime for police officers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have, we have four goals. Huh? We have the life of the hostage, 
we have the life of the hostage taker, we have the life of the neighbors, like third parties, and we have the life of uh, police officers. So let's imagine there's a situation where you have to make a decision. Um, which one is number one? Which one is the most important goal from your perspective? Which life is the most important one? Hostage. Hostage. Okay, number two? Police. Third parties, police, and number four, hostage taker. So please correct me if I'm wrong, if I, if I, if I may summarize it. Uh, number one, the life of the uh, hostage is very important. Number two, neighbors, third parties, police officers. Uh, would you agree that the hostage taker is number four? No. That he's the, the loser? No. So who, please raise your hand if you say, number one is the hostage, number four is hostage taker. Do you agree? Okay, I would say minimum 90%. Okay, so now we have a, a decision, and I would like to focus on new negotiations. How to negotiate a venture deal? Um, let's say you have to negotiate against me, against our company, you have to negotiate against Sabine. Um, you ask us to do an in-house workshop in your company. You ask, what's your, what's your fee? My fee for in-house workshop is, as an example. <laughs> 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 so do you think, do you think there's, there's a room for negotiation? Do you think there are options, there are possibilities? Yes. Hold on, right now, you possibly made a, make a huge mistake. Right now, you're negotiating with yourself. You think about it. Never negotiate with yourself. You always have to negotiate against me. Because if you negotiate with yourself, you always end up in a disaster. Because what you don't know and what you can't know is there room for a negotiation or not? You have no idea. I would possibly reduce my fee to 99, or it could be also take it or leave it. You have no idea. So one principle in a negotiation is never negotiate with yourself. Always negotiate with the other one. Because you have no idea what's, what's important for me. So let's, ass let's assume I do have a walkaway position. Let's say it's 60. Do I have to tell you my walkaway position? Should I tell you 100 would be great, but 60 would be also okay? <laughs> no. Next question, even more difficult. Are you allowed to ask me about my walkaway position? Could you say, Matthias, uh, come on, let's do a shortcut. What's your walkaway position? Matthias, please give me your best and final offer. <laughs> Is it smart? No because you force me to lie. I start with my proposal, it's 100. And then you're telling me, come on, Matthias, let's do a shortcut. What's your best and final? Then I have to tell you, 100. Because otherwise I would lose my face. Then, and then it's set in stone. So very important in a negotiation, never ask for the final price. Never ask for best and final, because you will never get the truth. <laughs> um, you need to negotiate. So you come up with your counter proposal. Let's say, based on your internal cost-cutting program, Synergy 2020, um, you, ca you can't pay more than 40. What I don't know is 40 is just an anchor? Is it it's your goal? Or it's your walk-away position? I have no idea. Let's say for this example, your walk-away position is 80. So if you look at this chart, then you might get the impression that there's a huge gap, you know, 140. So we do, have an in, we do have a visible 100, and we do have a visible 40. Uh, what you can't see is the invisible walk-away position. It's on this uh, chart, 60 and 80. So for your negotiation, it's very important. What you see in a negotiation uh, is not important. So if someone has come up with, with a ridiculous price, uh, don't take notes. <laughs> don't write it down. What you need to find out is the walk away position. So in a short summary, if you, if you prepare your negotiation, just take a piece of pa a paper, write down what's, it your, what's your target and what's your walk away position. If you don't reach your walk away position, if, if you don't reach 60, if I don't reach uh, 60 in this example, then I have to walk away. Walking away is not a failure. It's just a disagreement. So you agree to disagree, it's your decision to walk away. And 
what what we what we uh, analyzed in in a very very often in, in negotiations uh, that you are emotionally attached, that you renegotiate your walk away position under pressure, and that's why I would like to show you the team structure which you need for tough negotiations. So I mentioned it before I worked undercover for um, for six years. Um, what do you think? What is the biggest danger in working undercover? What do you think? Drugs? <laughs> no? <laughs> um, you start to understand the other side. You adapt their language, their behavior. Um, so I got native. Do you know this, this wording? Huh? Going native, I became a member of the other side. Um, they asked me to step out of this business. My colleague, he stayed one year longer. He's now a pimp. You know what a pimp is? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> in Nuremberg. Um, so I stepped out, uh, I went to university, and then they asked me to join the negotiation task force because they told me, hey, Matthias, you know how to negotiate with this community, you know the wording, you know their philosophy. So I became a so-called speaking negotiator, someone who was able to talk to these guys because I understood their language, their philosophy. In a tough negotiation, like in a hostage taking or in, in a bank robbery, uh, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, helicopters are circling, you see the snipers, and there's a lot of pressure. And that's why you never negotiate alone, there's always a second one. It's a so-called non-speaking negotiator, this guy is called a commander. As a commander, you observe the situation, making sure that there is no um, emotional reaction. Number three, a decision maker. A decision maker is responsible for the entire operation. So what do you think? Should a decision maker, should they listen to the negotiation? What do you think? No, because if they listen to the negotiation, they're also emotionally involved, and then they will make mistakes. What we analyzed during the last couple of years, that if you negotiate, you shouldn't be emotionally involved. And if you're emotionally involved, if you believe you are right, then you can't negotiate. So you, knew, you need always another one taking over the negotiator role. What you could do as a founder, for example, if you want to sell your company, it's your baby, you developed it, you're so proud. And then you negotiate with an investor. You want 100, they tell you 40. <laughs> and then you're so emotionally involved, and then you make mistakes. So what you need to do if you start a negotiation with these investors, uh, never, never, never sit on the chair of a speaking negotiator. Hire someone to negotiate for you. Because if you're emotionally involved, you will make mistakes. Your role is to become a commander. As a commander, you sit there, you listen to the negotiation, and then you see what's going on. If you get the feeling something is going wrong, you're, you're heading in the wrong direction, then you ask for a timeout, you step out, new briefing, and then you come back. So if you're, if you're a founder, if you're an entrepreneur, please keep in mind, selling a company, for you, it's very often, it's, it's, one, it's one in a lifetime, once in a lifetime. For investors, it's day-to-day -day business. And these guys on the other side, they are brilliant negotiators. They know exactly what to do. And they are not emotionally involved, <laughs> because for them, it's day-to-day -day business. For you, it's your baby selling it to them. That's why I would like to summarize it in, in some, let's call it principles. Number one, what's your goal? What do you want? What's your, um, what's your asking price versus what's your walk away position? So here's my advice, write it down, take notes because you need it under pressure. Never renegotiate your walk away position in a negotiation. If you can't reach your price, your walk away price, then you have to walk away. Later on, I could show you how to do it. Very important, uh, if you want to sell, sell. What you should not do, uh, you should not start talking to investors just to see what's possible. So a lot of um, startups, they ask us for, for, for our support, and then they ask, what's your goal? And they, they are telling me, you know, Matthias, if I would get 100, then I will sell it. And 
I, I always tell them, don't do it. <laughs> because if you, if you step in a negotiation, then you have to negotiate. If you don't, if you're not sure, if you want to sell, if you, do, if you want to do an IPO or something else, don't negotiate. So if you want to sell, then you need to be prepared and then you have to negotiate. If you don't want to sell, don't negotiate. If you're not sure, don't negotiate. If you want to negotiate, set up your team. Never become a speaking negotiator, always a commander. And uh, number four, uh, there's always a decision maker. What we have, um, what, what we have seen very often, that you guys start up, that you negotiate with the lower management, um, that you exchange numbers, figures, ideas, but you start a negotiation without a strategic decision. So here is my advice. Before you start talking about all numbers and all that stuff, or the nitty gritty, yeah, you need to talk to decision makers. So before you talk about all the stuff, try to, to uh, set up a meeting with the decision maker on the other side and ask one question, which is, do you want us? Uh, we need a strategic decision. Yeah? Does our company, does it fit into your portfolio? After getting a yes, then you start to negotiate with the ne negotiation team. Number five, <coughs> uh, put the fish on the table. Um, that's also a huge mistake in, in a lot of the negotiations in venture deals. There are two philosophies in a negotiation. Number one is um, low-hanging fruits first. That means you start a negotiation uh, with your basket in your arms, you go through the garden, and you collect the low-hanging fruits. A uh, big advantage, um, yeah, you create a positive atmosphere, it's great, it's fun. Uh, the problem is, at the end of a negotiation process, then you have to negotiate the stumbling blocks, the real problems. The other philosophy is put the fish on the table. If you do have a fish, so if you want something, then you have to tell it at the beginning, you have to tell them what you want. So from our, our perspective, based on our experience, never come up with fruits. Don't talk about the easy stuff at the beginning. Tell them what you want at the beginning. Put the fish on the table. Very important, set up a timeline. So when we, when we step in, um, so startups ask us for our support, and then I ask them, so what's, what's going on? In 99%, they are telling us, Matthias, we wait for an answer. <laughs> yeah. We made a proposal, we had great meetings, they told us they love us, they love our product, they are excited, yeah. <laughs> everything is perfect. And then I ask, okay, sounds good, uh, what's the next step? Uh, yes, we wait. <laughs> we wait for the answer. If you wait, you will lose. That's why before you send a proposal, before you make an offer, before you put the fish on the table, you need to negotiate the timeline. Meaning, we want a decision about number one by end of this week, about number two next week. So set up a timeline because um, if you have to wait for something, then you can say, we are running out of time, and then you, then you have the right to call the decision maker, uh, involving them, telling them that we are running out of time. And number three, uh, agrees, uh, agreement or uh, disagreement, that means if you reach an agreement, so if you want to sell your company for 100, and you receive an agreement for 100, if you receive an agreement, Never, if you reach an agreement, never, never feel like a winner. Never smile. Never high five. <laughs> never give the impression that you are a winner. If you don't reach your um, walk away position, then you have to walk away. If you walk away, it's exactly the same behavior. <laughs> never smile. <laughs> and never accuse them. Don't tell them they, regret, they will regret. Just walk away by, say, by opening three doors. So if you don't reach your walk away position, you say, thank you. You talk about common interests, that it was great to exchange ideas, to discuss all the options. And then you open three doors. Then you say, from my perspective, today, based on what we have discussed, I can't stick to my proposal anymore. From my perspective means, possibly another one from my company could step in. Today means possibly tomorrow it's a different game. 
And based on what we have discussed, you could come up with a new fish with a new demand. So if you walk away, always open three doors, yeah? making sure that you can step in, because then I can call you tomorrow. I could tell you, you know, uh, yesterday I told you from my perspective it's not possible, but my, my colleagues have been, here's an idea. Or you could say, tomorrow I got a new information, I would like to share this information. One, number three, based on what we have discussed, could we talk about an online seminar? If you walk away, never close the doors, never burn a bridge, uh, because you need open doors to restart uh, negotiation. So here's my question. What should we do with the hostage taker? After 24 hours of negotiation, the decision maker said, okay, based on my experience, I think we need a decision. The decision maker asked the commander, commander, what should we do? What's going on in the negotiation? The commander replied, oh, he's getting tired, he's, he's quite nervous, the hostage taker. And the, the decision maker said, okay, come on, what, what's going on there? The commander replied in German, um, the hostage taker is butterweich, which means soft like butter, almost done. So now it's your decision. What do you want to do? You have three options. Number one, you could kill the hostage taker, snipers. Number two, you could send in the SWAT team. Number three, you could continue the negotiation process. The question is, what, what, what do you want to do? So please raise your hand. So you have three options. Again, after 24 hours of negotiation, he's getting tired, nervous. Snipers, SWAT team, and negotiation. What would you do? So please raise your hand if you say, let's kill the hostage taker. Two, three, four, five. What about SWAT? What about continue the negotiation? 90, 95%. Um, I'm surprised. Because I asked you the same question 23 minutes ago. <laughs> All right? I asked you 23 minutes ago, what would you do if there is a situation where you have to make a decision? What's our goal? Number one? Saves the hostage. There is just one option to make sure she will survive, which is kill the hostage taker. The decision maker decided, let's kill the hostage taker. He told the snipers to kill the hostage takers. Snipers to the commander, we need the hostage taker at the window. Commander to negotiator, tell him he should come to the window. Negotiator to hostage taker, please come to the window. <laughs> Not like this, of course. <laughs> it's not so easy. Um, the negotiator asked the, um, the hostage taker, do you want more food? He said, yes. There was a SWAT team. Um, they took a, a basket with food in it. They fixed it with a rope. And from the balcony above this apartment, they let the basket down. The hostage taker went to the window he tried to grab the basket in the second they killed the hostage taker. Did we achieve our target? So here are the bad, here's the bad news. In tough negotiations, you can't achieve all your goals. It's not possible. You can't get money, you can't establish a great relationship, you can't get whatever you want. It's not possible. In a tough negotiation, you have to make a decision. What what you have to do, write it down, what's target number one, number two, number three, number four. What you did right now, under the impression of emotions, <laughs> you decided differently to, be, to, to your decision which you made before. So very important, if you're under pressure, if you don't reach your um, walk away pers uh, perspective, your walk away position, then you have to walk away. And sometimes you have to kill the hostage taker to uh, rescue the hostage. And that's my key message for my speech. You need to know what, what's your goal. And under pressure, never renegotiate your goal. And now we take your question. Thank you so much for listening.
you. Thank you, Matthias. Who here now feels confident that they can change this guy's mind <laughs> at five o'clock? Yeah, so speaking to Matthias is always great because you feel empowered in business, you feel empowered in your marriage, you feel empowered with your kids. So you guys are now um, armed with some very top uh, negotiation tips and tactics. So we are getting your questions. Um, through Slido, so thank you for those of you that contributed. Ah, I like this question. Matthias, is Trump really a good negotiator? Without the size and power of the U.S., he would, in my opinion, not be doing so well. So I picked this because we fight about this all the time. <laughs> so he can answer it. Go ahead. So, uh, Sabine is from New York, and as you know, New Yorkers, they hate Trump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's from, he's from New York. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my, I, from, from, a, from a negotiation perspective, not, a, you know, not about the, the personality, yeah? just about from a negotiation perspective. He's, from my perspective, a great negotiator because in more than one and a half year, we are discussing his topics. He's not discussing our topics. So he's setting the, an the anchor. He's, um, he's setting the, we call it always the sandbox. We are playing in his sandbox in more than one and a half year. Uh, and that's why he's, from my perspective, a very professional negotiator. Um, because as, what, what, from, from my understanding, he's a gambler. Uh, um, so I always, if I talk to you, if I analyze you, uh, possibly later at, uh, at our booth, if I analyze, you always try to find out, are you a rational negotiator or are you a gambler? Yeah? So rational negotiator, uh, if you're a rational negotiator, then you believe in cause and effect. Because I have done a great job last year, I want more money for the future. That's cause and effect. If you're a gambler, you come up with a ridiculous demand. <laughs> yeah? And because it's fun. <laughs> It's fun. Yeah? You, 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 you're, you're waiting for a reaction. So please raise your hand. It's not about good or bad, yeah? just to know. Who would say, I'm a rational negotiator, I believe in cause and effect? Oh my God, that's not good. <laughs> Who's a gambler? Okay. Um, so based on my experience, if a, if a rational negotiator is negotiating with a rational negotiator, yeah, you will achieve a great agreement. If a gambler is negotiating with a gambler, they also reach a great agreement and they have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> if you are rational, negotiating with a gambler, you lose. Because you're, you're so upset <laughs> about this son of a, you know. <laughs> you are so angry because he's, huh? um, If you're a gambler, then you like the negotiation style of Trump because he is playing the game. If you're a rational negotiator, then you don't understand this guy because he's not rational. He's a gambler. So and here's, based on my experience, here, here's his secret. If you're a gambler, then you know sometimes I win and sometimes I lose. And losing is not a problem for him. That's why he's coming up every day with a, with a nonsense, <laughs> a new, ridiculous uh, um, demand because he is, he's, not a, he's not afraid about losing. And um, that's why, yes, he's a good negotiator and I'm sure he will be re-elected because he knows exactly how to play the game. And um, North Korea, for example, from my perspective, that's a great achievement which is obviously not good news for us in the U.S., <laughs> but it is what it is. Now, I have another question. I think it was on the screen, but we get this often. The question was about gender. Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference if you are negotiating with women? And a few questions uh, came up on this, so it is something people are thinking. What do you think, Matthias? Um, so, uh, at diversity, this is what we have before, is, is very important for companies. It's also important for negotiation teams. I don't separate negotiators in, in male or female. I only separate in, in gamblers and rational. 
And based on my perspective, uh, there are uh, female rational negotiators and female uh, gamblers. <laughs> We have another one. Somebody is clearly trying to make a move. <laughs> Any tips for negotiating a better salary? Who was that? All of you? <laughs> All of you. Uh, so if you, uh, very important, if you want, if you want to get more money, um, if you want something, you have to give something. Mm -hmm. uh, you should never reflect on the past. You should never say, I've done a great job <laughs> because you got money for this already. Huh? Uh, so never talk about the past, never come up, come up with just one demand, money. It should be always minimum 10 different demands. Um, never say every, everything is, is, is getting ex more expensive and my colleagues and all that. Uh, so it's just you, you negotiating with your, uh, with your boss. Um, never threaten them. Never tell them you have a better offer from a competitor, uh, because all leaders I know, if they, if, they, if they realize that you're thinking about choosing another company, then they, they would never say it, but for them, you are, you are dead, dead in the water. Yeah? So, in summary, 10 demands, never the past, and never compare yourself with other colleagues. Just say, I want more, and this is what I would like to uh, offer. Yeah, very valuable advice. Now, we have less than three minutes left, but I would like to ask you, Matthias, um, oftentimes people ask us, you know, this is really great, you're giving us the tools, you're giving us the tactics, can we actually do this? So what, are, what is your advice for them to really be disciplined in this implementation? Is this actually possible in real life, what you are describing? Oh, of course it is. Uh what, what you need to do, uh, you have to practice every day. Uh? Mm -hmm. So um, I practice every day with my wife, with my four kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, they are definitely irrational. <laughs> um, so it's, it's all about, it's all about uh, practicing and coming back to, to, to your uh, highly rated people you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to separate uh, the negotiation process from, from a sales process. So let's say here we start the process. Uh? So I'm a sales guy negotiating with you. I know you. Yeah? So in this phase, relationship is important to convince you, um, to get more information what you really want. I have to understand your pain. And then I can, I can come up with a solution. So in this phase, it's important to know someone, to establish a relationship. And then you ask for a 10% price reduction. <laughs> and from now on, I'm in a negotiation. That's not a negotiation. The negotiation starts now, because now you're in a conflict. They want 10% price reduction, which you don't want to give. So from now on, you have to step out of the negotiation, and here you have to bring in a professional negotiator, because if they ask you for a price reduction, you will be emotionally more evolved, and then you will make mistakes. Um, so having good relationship, being win-win oriented, that's, that's amazing and it's very important. It's not, if you know someone, that's great. Not in a negotiation. It's easier to negotiate with strangers uh, because you are not emotionally involved. It's easier to achieve your target. Yeah. Okay, and that's it for Matthias Schreiner. If we could have a round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.